And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, the, mas the mastermind behind Black Flag Printing Press, and creator of the upcoming game Blood and Thunder, which is currently in the playtesting phase, the one and only Ramtide, who probably listened to way too much Mastodon back in the day. How are you doing today, man? I, I did. <laughs> I'm doing great, man. How are you doing, bro? I'm, do I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, it is j it's it's smack dab in the middle of January, which means I'm freezing my ass off, as usual. Hey, me too. <laughs> well, how cold is cold for you? Well, I chase the sun. I'm a bit of an American vagabond by trade. So, you know, right when it gets down to freezing point, that's about when it gets cold for me. I live a life of luxury, and I'm a weenie about it. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> as for me, it is currently... Um, well, it, well, factoring in wind chill, it's going to feel like negative 20. Ah, oh, jeez, I don't, I don't envy you, bro. I don't envy you one bit. <laughs> yeah... Everybody, everybody think everybody always everybody always laughs laughs about the winters around here until they until they end up getting a winter storm of their own and then they panic. Oh, I've I've been in a few winter storms. You know, I lived in the highlands in New Mexico for a while. And the funny thing is, everybody thinks, oh, it's the desert, it's warm, right? Well, at nine thousand feet, no, and not really. You know, so I, I've been down in the negatives before, trudged through a few feet of snow. I'm no stranger to it. Oh. But uh, that's why I'm not there. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to open with the humble beginnings. So walk okay. me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? My first introduction to role-playing games was probably about two decades ago now. I was just a teenager at the time. I want to say maybe 13 or 14. And I had a friend who lived one night when they were running a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. You know, mm -hmm. All the nerds showed up. I showed up. I was there. And now I played some video games. I saw they were doing this. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, playing tabletop. I'm like, oh, okay. So I sat in. I watched for a bit. I asked if I could roll up a character. There, it's really been full tilt ever since. For a while, me and a few of those guys split an apartment. And he Just it, it was something that really fully captured my imagination because it it feels so limitless, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a prescribed set of rules, and this is the setting and the theme, and this is what you're running with. But beyond that, you can craft any adventure to your taste within that, and so that really just grabbed my imagination, and I ran with it. Mm -hmm. I ran with it so much that I started GMing games. I eventually got the noble title of Eternal GM. Uh, I've not been a player since because I hate the game. I've been seeing other people. Years have gone by. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the humble beginnings. I got I gotcha. Now with the, with that in mind, as I under, as I understand it, um Blood and Thunder is an eight is an age of sale role playing game. Yes, sir. Age of Sail role-playing game. Uh, the focus, obviously, see, you are a gentleman of fortune uh, aboard a pirate ship, mm -hmm. uh, signed the Articles of Agreement, member of the crew, all of that good stuff. Um, a loosely based it with, well, excuse me, not loosely based, but it includes folkloric and semi-mystical elements. Yeah. Uh, for example, for a lot of the creatures I've been pulling folklore creatures, uh, like, you know, bunyips, naiads, uh, fin foam, stuff like that, and, and incorporating them in the game. Uh, I want that sort of mystical element to it. What's a game about pirates, for example, if you're not hunting down cursed Spanish treasure at the bottom of the sea, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, captain's gone mad from drinking too much, think he met a, a really peculiarly damp sailor 
in a gambling game. And the crew assures him, oh, you just got wasted that night. So he dragged it back to the ship, but he wakes up with a strange map in his pocket. You know? So there's this kind of, like, ghost stories, folklore, monster element going on alongside it uh, as a parallel. Uh, and that was something that I, I've been paying some detail to because I wanted it to be a season on the steak mm-hmm. instead of the steak itself, you know? Uh, a flavor, if you will, instead of the focus. So maritime piracy with a touch of the supernatural. Mm-hmm. So let me ask one of the... One of the big quest one of the big questions in the room. Why pirates? <laughs> you cannot answer everything's better with pirates. I mean that was gonna be my first answer. Yeah, but uh, that's why? too easy. Why pirates? I've always been drawn to the sea. I grew up on it. Uh, I wouldn't be supl- surprised if there's like some kind of folk genetic memory within me because, you know, I, I'm Scandinavian uh, and British, so it, and my last name is the same last name of like famous admirals and shit. So I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere along the lines there was somebody in the blood who sailed, and that memory just is present in me, and I feel called to the aesthetic and thematic trappings. Of this. And I can even continue to. Laugh. Like moving into uh, my back. We have street privacy out here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that there is a call, just a motivational, thematic call. It's an archetype to me that I really enjoy. Uh, it's it's freedom, you know. It's uh, liberty and ease. It's doing what you want when. Who wouldn't balance fate on that side when the worst that is hazarded for is a sour look or two on choking? Mm-hmm. So that's why. Okay, I can certainly get that. Now, I'm no str- um, were there in- were there any um any age of any age of sail or swashbuckly games that um ter- that turned you on to that idea that you've that you've played with? Not really, you know. Uh, I feel that it's mostly been kind of a neglected niche. I mean, I know that there have been some video games that have come out that have dealt with it. Uh, sea of Thieves being perhaps the most piece that comes to mind. I haven't had a, a good proper AAA release. There, w- we get we came dangerously close to one that would have been actually interesting, but di- but Disney decided to be stupid. I'm not surprised. It is Disney. Uh, the Mouse Overlord demands respect. Go on. <laughs> um, there was a game in development a, f- a generation ago called Pirates of the Caribbean: Armada of the Damned. It okay. was not going to be. It was not going to be based on any of the films per se, but still, it's set in that universe, and mm-hmm. it was going to be an act- Was going to lean more action RPG, almost, almost like Fable, especially okay. given the fact that it had a. Um, it was implied that it was going to have an a alignment system, much like the good and evil thing that Fable has, but instead right. you were either dashing or dreaded. Right, right. The charismatic pirate versus just the one who just instills yeah. the dre- it's uh, Cook versus Blackbeard, for example. Yeah. The dread, the dread, the exam, the um, visualization that they were going with with the dreaded th- end of it were. Where, where, say, bar- characters like Barbosa when he was still undead, or um, Davy Jones. Yeah. And the de- the dreaded pirate was u- was using an anchor on a chain as a weapon in the tr- in the trailer that was advertised. There was some demonstration footage, but because of the f- because of the fact that the big push to try and to try and make Tron into a big franchise didn't work that was going around around that time that was when legacy and the tr- and the um tron cartoon were co- were coming around and the right. with the idea of making that making that into an of reviving that into a full on franchise and that didn't sti- that didn't stick they ended up pull- they ended up um either disney or buena vista games ended up pulling a panic move and dr- and dropped armada of the damned in the process that's a tragedy, man. Because I tell you, there just isn't enough good, yeah. piratically themed uh, entertainment out there. Um, 
you know, I know, Sc- I know it, it Skull and Bones. Bo- I know Skull and Bones is on, is on the is on the horizon, but I don't even know if that's ever gonna, coming out. Um, there was Bla- there was um, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, which I remember that, but I didn't game. play it. Yeah. Uh, although the f- but that's that's f- I feel like uh, an aesthetic piracy instead of a sort of mechanical piracy. You know. Yeah, and uh, because been... it's still very much an Assassin's Creed game. Yeah, but with the backdrop of uh, nautical themes, and with with something like Skull and Bones, you're 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 again, you're only going to be controlling the ship for most of it instead instead of being a bit more personal. Right, um, right. I I feel like a good pirate game, honestly, would include you know not only controlling your character but having a say in how the ship is controlled mm-hmm. and even in how the crew is. You know, because some, these things some should strange. not be backdrops. I've seen some strategy games dip in, dip into it, but there have been a handful of instances when it comes to role playing games. Um, right. I'd say the I'd say the biggest example to me that com- that comes to mind is Seventh C. I think I've heard of that, but I didn't delve too deeply on it. Um, I think this was back in the day when Blood and Thunder was still just a bra- a brainchild to me. Yeah. And, you know, I was looking up sailor superstitions, and I think I found a link to their game, but I didn't dig too closely. I wouldn't say Seven C well. is full-on pirates, but ge- but mm-hmm. general general swashbuckling. You can certainly go the pirate route, but that's just one route you can take. Right. Um, it, it's not thematically dedicated to piracy. No. Much it's much like in the same much like in the same way that. It's um sister game at the time, Legend of the Five Rings, one of my favorites. Um, mm-hmm. You're technically most characters are technically going to be samurai, but there's a lot of there's a lot of variation in that regard. Right. What exactly constitutes a samurai? Well, how do you play your samurai? Yeah, especially especially given that the clans in um, L5R have different outlooks on it. Some of some of them try to some of them go some of them have their own interpretations. Some go with the spirit with the letter of Bushido. Some go with the spirit of it, but selectively interpret some parts of it. Then you have the scorpions who who are who um are treated as the vi- are treated as the villains. Something that something that they intentionally <laughs> um encourage because it, because it means that they can do all. All their all their backstabbing and dirty tricks without with with um with the full assumption that people are gonna or that people are gonna not trust them anyways. Um, there, it's hard it's hard to summarize, but there are paradox in the fact that they're fanatically loyal, but they're liars, cheaters, and thieves. Well, I don't necessarily see anything paradoxical with that. It's like a you know, fanatically yeah. loyal to his they're, crew and his mates, they're but loyal, uh, they're loyal you know, to if the you're empire, a shoreside but... landlubber, he's gonna swindle the hell out of you. They're loyal to the they're loyal to the empire, but they um, but their idea is they protect it from the liars, cheaters, and thieves by becoming liars, cheaters, and thieves. Fire with fire. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can. I'd see. I've seen. Um, it's. It's. There's. There are a few. There are a few others. Um, Seven C is just the. Bi- is just the big one that always comes to mind on that front. Um. And. There, I believe, and there's one. Uh, there's one other. But um, the Devil in the Deep, which is being, which is currently being developed, that's going to be using the Gumshoe engine. But okay. Even. But even within. Even within the realm of tabletop, and even with the library of knowledge that I have, the majority end up t- end up taking a general swashbuckly set swashbuckly age of sale setting instead of the inbuilt assumption that the player characters are going to be pirates. Not right. to say that they can't; it's just that that's one avenue. So, seeing one that's exclusively focused on that is still te- is still technically a minority. I could believe it. And that was one thing I wanted players to go in with the knowledge of, is that they are pirates. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the first acts in setting up the game that you have to do as a character is draft up articles of agreement with your crew and sign them. I don't know if you're familiar with what the articles of agreement are. 
I but, am, uh, it was but good. for the purposes of the audience, could you give the skinny? Certainly. So the Articles of Agreement were a governing code aboard a pirate ship, and upon being pressed into service as a pirate, you were expected to sign the Articles of Agreement. If you were illiterate, you could just put an X. Um, what the Articles would often lay out were distribution of loot after a successful raid on a ship, or what punishments were acceptable when brought down from the uh, commanding officers. Like, uh, oh, you stole from uh, Mr. Bones over there? Well, we'll allow a flogging for that, but a keel hauling is going a wee bit too far. There were uh, rules, for example, on how to resolve disputes, mm -hmm. which may be as elaborate as, say, a pirate court, or as simple as drawing pistols and declaring your innocence. Among other things, it may include, you know, uh, decorum and shoreside behavior, for example. Uh, there, were, there were all sorts of governing facets involved in, in these articles. We're expected to sign them up. For 20. So, one of the first things in the creation of a game of Blood and Thunder that I wanted that screen. Get the players together, brainstorm the terms by which the ship is going to operate, how much everybody receives from loot per, you know, this or that or the other. There are options for recourse, you know, if, if an officer or somebody steps out of line, and have that sort of structure going into the game. Uh, the articles were often chosen very democratically. They were usually a means to within the articles. So I thought that was a good touch to kind of get people in the mode that, okay, this is a this is a pirate convention. This is what they do. If I'm signing articles of agreement, that means I become a pirate. Yeah. Our life is now getting treasure at the business end of a rifle. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my idea to kickstart that mentality and bring the focus into what I wanted it to be about. Now, with that in mind, one of the one of the big thing, one of the big things that was that is brought up when it comes to dealing with dealing with the age of sail and why and why pirates would go out pirating is the letter of mark. And I'm curious if oh, you're if you're talking know. about privateers. Yeah, the whole okay. Look, if look if you're go if you're gonna go out in the sea and wreck people's shit, um, as long as you at wreck least their do shit, it for we'll, the queen. As, if, yeah. as long as you wreck their shit, we'll look the other way. <laughs> yeah, but everybody else counts you as a bloody pirate. Yeah. And I do want to include letters of mark. Uh, I have not written in anything for them yet, but it is on the list. But that's more of a, a flavor thing, I feel like, than an actual mechanical thing. So. It's on the burner. It's just not getting cooked quite yet. Yeah, right I, now, we're crunching mechanics. I, I can get that. I've I've taken the I've taken the um, I've taken the Terry Pratchett approach of there's there's always going to be crime, so it may as well be organized. Right. It might as well work in our favor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> uh, look, you can't beat the system, but you can break it. <laughs> I didn't sell out. I bought in. <laughs> but with but with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, there's a lot that you can tell from a game just based on just based on its core mechanic in terms of rolling the die if you even roll the die. Hi, Amber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or or if the die is not a die. Hello, Dragonlance right. Fifth Age. Uh, so what's what is the core? resolution system that you that you're working on currently we are working with a d100 base uh often in relations to a series of skills there's 25 skills maybe. so are, are d100 are we talking roll high like in roll master or are we talking roll low like in rune quest equal to and below okay, so, uh okay, so, so there's the there's 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 a skill system, right? You've got 25 skills, seven are governed by weapons, the rest mm -hmm. are for kind of role play or situational. Yeah. Uh So there are a few methods for determining successes on an action. Mm -hmm. Um the first is direct checks. Direct checks come in a series of difficulty. Uh, off at the top of my head, I believe it's simple, easy, average, difficult, advanced and master which correlate to 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. So the way that works, okay, is that some direct checks 
if specified, will have a target difficulty to them. Mm -hmm. Now, what the target difficulty means is that you have to have that amount of points in that skill. Like, if you're trying to do something with an easy difficulty, that's 20, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have at least 20 skill points in that skill to even pose a chance of succeeding at the task in the first place. So that, that doesn't mean you can't attempt it. Like, let's say, you know, Billy Bones needs to get his arm o- amputated, and that's a advanced uh, medicine check, you know, a difficulty of 80. You've only got 73 in medicine. I mean, you can still try to do it. It might not end well. So that's the first threshold that you have to beat, is on this difficulty system. If you meet the requirement on the difficulty for the skill check, you can then, you know, roll with an obvious chance of success, and then you have to roll equal to or below your governing skill value to succeed in the check. So that's a direct check. The second one is opposing checks. Opposing checks come into question when whatever you're trying to perform the skill on has some sort of agency, if it can react to what you're doing, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So uh, let's go back to the example of doing the amputation. Let's say uh, the ship's doctor called you over to hold over, hold down Mr. Bones while he tries to saw off his lip. You can make a unarmed check, you know, grappling, to hold him in place against, say, his athletics check. Now, his athletics score will be deducted from your unarmed skill to get you the dice check value, which you need to roll equal to or below to pass it. If his athletics is unfortunately higher than your unarmed, you're going to fail no matter what. So this brings into the table the agency of objects or people or things that you're trying to have an effect on and whether they can react to it or not. Like you're trying to persuade someone, well, it's your tact versus their observation. And maybe they know right out the gate that no matter what you say, you're full of bullshit. But maybe, despite the odds, you can still convince them either way. So that's the basis for the skill systems. It's a D100, uh, features prominently in, in the core, and that's how skill checks work. All right. Now, given given that you mentioned ah. that you're doing a D100 approach, um, right. My next my next question revolves around an issue that can sometimes happen with percentile systems, ba- um, basic role playing, which is used for rune quests. Call of Cthulhu, uh, and so on, has th- has this issue, as well as well as of course, war- as well as of course, um, Warhammer Fantasy and the FFG era of 40k role playing. Um, and that is swinginess, i.e., you either roll like shit or you roll really well, with but very but very often, not a not a middle gr- not a middle ground in that. How do you how do you address that particular swinginess that happens with a percentile system? You know, the closest addresses that I have to the swinginess in a percentile system has mm-hmm. come in the form of uh well, there's there's a few things. Uh one is a fate point system. Mm-hmm. So one of the stats, your primary attributes is fortune, and depending on how many points you sink into it, you get fate points. And these points you can use to re-roll, for example, uh, any roll that affects you or is performed by you. Mm-hmm. So that gives you a chance to alter the outcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, additionally, within the exploit systems, there are features as you rank up in your skills, you can take exploits. They're like feats. Mm-hmm. And some of these may offer you the chance to re-roll or pass a check or add a certain primary attribute as a bonus to your check to increase the value. The swingingness is still there. That's always going to be there as a a result of the dice. But what I wanted to offer players was an option to game the system, maybe, Mm -hmm. and see if they can't affect the outcome to something more favorable. I, I can certainly get that. And since you since you mentioned... Um, attributes. Since you mentioned the, pr- the presence of attributes, I'm guessing that you're going to have a attribute skill relationship in some form when it comes to determining die rolls. So the attributes come into play when you are calculating your initial skill values. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, afterwards, advancing the skill values, it's dependent upon one of your attributes and a trainer system. So you go out of your way, you find a trainer, you pay him whatever he charges to teach you more of his skill. Uh, he can't teach you, obviously, beyond what his skill threshold is. Mm-hmm. So you find this guy to teach you more, a more, more nuance for any given skill that you're practicing. And then your skill value will increase equal number of points to your given governing attributes. So uh, let's say you're trading your cat, and that's based on how charming your attack will go up a number of skill points equal to your charm value. Mm -hmm. Or if you're doing like athletics, that's very, you know, uh, I guess like stamina dependent. Mm -hmm. So again, you'd see the same thing. So that's that's kind of the big the big crux on advancing. All all right. Now given given that you seem to be aiming for a degree of um a degree of groundedness. I was tempted to use the term realism, but that's way too. Uh, yeah, that's pushing it. Well, that that and I f- I find the term realism to be overrated. To be honest, yeah. I vastly prefer the term believability. Right. Al- although grounded is, I'd say I'd say it would fit more. I'd say it would fit more the uh, on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to fantasy, because it's on a scale. Yeah. It's on a um, scale. Um. You, you're you're likely aiming for something freeform, and I don't think you're. Obviously, you're not doing classes. I was able. I'm yes. able to pick. Th- there, that there are no quick. classes. However, are you doing archetypes? I have done occupations. Uh, basically, occupations. You know, have a minimum statistical requirement to take the occupation, mm-hmm. and that determines your job on the ship, and. Depending on your job on the ship, it may give you bonuses or additional exploits. Two ranks, uh, obviously, common sailors and officer classes, kind of your prestige classes. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of what the, the archetypes are. And they don't really affect much on some of the officer classes. If you make it to an officer rank, you gain some unique exploits mm-hmm. based on your officer rank. You know, like, uh, you, know, you, get cap- you get captain abilities. Uh, but yeah, no. So, so the archetypes uh, take place in the occupations, and if you meet the requirements for any occupation, then yes, you can take it, and they will offer you bonuses or advancements to your skills. But it still leaves that free forkness. You're not locked in forever in being the ship's carpenter. Maybe you gain some skills, and you can go become the ship's gunner and change out your bonuses from the carpenter to what the gunner gets. So there, there still is that that freeformness, but you you can specialize as a result of it. Mm-hmm. Now, I should I should note that when I when I refer to when I refer to archetypes that take that can take one of two forms. Um, one form is a essentially a starting package. This is right. the more popular form. The um, another set another possibility when it comes to archetypes and. Is n- not necessarily what can you what can you learn, but more what are you better at learning. A couple ex- a couple examples of this would be the subtypes that are in virtually every um, game that uses the storyteller system, whether that be Trinity, whether that be World of Darkness, or the best one, Exalted, or the weirdest one, Street Fighter, um, el- or the or the Technically, class system that's in um, Role Master and su- and subsequently stuff like Middle Earth role playing and Against the Dark Master, where where um, developing certain sk- certain skills and the like is cheaper or more expensive depending on your choice of class. Between those two, where would you say your occupation system would lean towards? Probably on the development of skills. In fact, most definitely on the development of skills. Because the skills that you receive bonuses to upon taking the occupation, you do train twice as fast. So, you know, like, let's say you take a carpenter, you've got shipwright skill as one of your primary skills for that class. Mm -hmm. Whenever you sink a point into shipwright, it counts as two. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth, depending which classes you choose. Or occupation, rather. Yeah. 
and now we now when it comes to like we've already covered this we've already covered the attribute and skill thing a lot of games will have will have some sort of extra element to allow for a degree of personalization um to give a few to give a few examples from other games obviously one of the obviously there's feats in D in D and D thir um third edition onward or um proficiencies in A D and D second edition um talents in Warhammer um per um perks and adv and advantages in World of Darkness. Do you have any? Do you have anything like that of of that sort of personalization? I do. I've actually been plugging away on that for the last week, and I'm looking at almost upwards of about 200 exploits at this point. Now, exploits are divided into several categories. You have uh, weapon skill exploits, uh, non-weapon skill exploits, you know, kind of like role playing skill exploits, primary attribute exploits, and miscellaneous game mechanic exploits. So, you know, to get an exploit requires that you spend character points, which you achieve by completing milestones. Maybe you capture a ship, you get some character points, you know, some good roleplay, your, your admiral team might give you a character point or two, you know, uh, find a treasure hoard, whatever, have some more character points, survive your hanging, you know. Mm -hmm. So you get these points that you can spend on advancements. And the advancements come in the form of exploits. Mm -hmm. Now... The exploits require that you purchase all the previous exploits in the tree and you meet the prerequisites before it. So, you know, if you have, if you have like, a maximum charm stat and you want to get that charm 10 exploit, then you have to buy all the exploits 1 through 9 in order to get that charm 10. Mm -hmm. You know, so that becomes your customization and personalization element and allows you to further flesh out into the type of style you want to play. Um... And like I said, I think I'm counting upwards of about 200 options right now. Uh, I need to run tests for the nautical combat, which should be coming very soon, because infantry scale is almost wrapped up before I can write some of the skills. You know, I'd like to have the tests in place, so I got a feel of where each skill may offer advantages as you level up in them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that is the, the advancement and personalization option. Uh, some exploits may obviously require a trainer, some may not. Uh, I like the idea of trainers in this game because, you know, you don't just learn something because you killed someone. You know, sometimes some things you need to have people show you. Mm. Like if you're going up the medicine tree, you want to get the clinical analysis perk, which basically lets you know the operating hit points of any combatant on the field at any given time then you're going to have to have somebody who's a medical professional train you be like, oh yeah, that's that's healthy, and that guy's on the verge of death, you know? Like, like, and this is why. So it gives a basis, and it adds that role-playing element for that downtime. Because, yeah, you know, you're not always, you're not going to fight a shit battle every day. You're not going to do a shore raid every day. There's going to be a lot of downtime after you're done sailing the ship and, you know, hanging out in the cold with your crew. So there needs to be something to fill that gap. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, what was the original question? I'm sorry, I went um, tangent. It was it was more of, it was more about what's about what sort of personalization personalization type effects you you were bringing in. So right. it wasn't just uh, so everything wasn't just attribute and skill roles. Yeah. So there is that. There's the exploit system. Mm -hmm. There's also the magic system, and the magic system I'm kind of proud. Because, well, once again, what's a game of pirates without ghost stories or, you know, like witch doctors and strange islands, you know, stuff like that. But at the same time, I was torn about including magic at first because we're so used to this all or nothing dichotomy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, either there's a wizard flying around shooting fireballs or there's no magic at all and it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want either of them. So I wrote in magic schools, and upon creation of a character, you can pick a magic school. There's six magic schools. Uh, one is holy, which is somebody who belongs to, say, like an organized religion with the church and singular deity to whom they pray and beseech in hopes of getting blessings or bones. The next is tribal, which is kind of like your witch doctor, shaman archetype. Their magic's typically characterized by, you know, 
uh, strange rituals, dead things, drugs, sex, banging drums, stuff like that. And that is how they summon the spirits of their tribe to act in their favor. Uh, beyond that, you have what's next? What's next? Only tribal. You have mysticism. Mystics look for signs in things that seem unlikely. Like a mystic may try to read bones or tea leaves, you know, to predict the future in the events that will unfold. There's no guarantee, obviously, that they're correct, but that's they believe it to be effective. So they look for signs in things that are unrelated. Mm. Mystic. Ah, uh, I always get hold up. There's one more I'm not remembering. There's enchantment which is the school of believing that you can imbue items with supernatural uh, properties uh and these enchantments they're not like i add a, a fire to my sword it's like i notch the kills of the slain in the blade thinking that it makes it more thirsty for blood kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh there's skepticism which is kind of your fedora tipping anti-magic atheist class who says it's all a load of bullshit it believes in the scientific method and rationality being the sole determiner of cause and effect. And the one that I find the most fun, perhaps, is superstition. And superstition varies from the others, because superstition does not require a deliberate effort for a magical spell. Mm -hmm. you know, the player doesn't necessarily have to do anything for a superstition spell to be cast, if there's a superstitious gentleman of fortune in your crew. Like, uh, you know, you may believe as a result of your superstition that whistling at sea is bad luck and it's going to summon a storm. But your tribal shipmate doesn't believe any of that. In fact, he thinks you're stupid and backwards idiot for believing that. So he's going to whistle songs on the deck all day. But you have no power over that. But yet the spell's still being cast. So that's kind of like a wild card kind of magic in a way. You know, and that's things like throwing salt over your shoulder or flipping coins or getting animal tattoos on your feet in case you go overboard. Stuff like that. Now, the magic is really, 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 really dialed back. I didn't want to play wizard. I wanted to play pirates. So, again, you're not going to be shooting ice spikes out of your fists. That's, that's not a thing. In fact, you may never even know if your spells were effective at all. The Admiralty plays it correctly. And that's kind of the goal. Mm -hmm. So it kind of bends on, like, this heavy kind of role-playing favor, in a way. Mm -hmm. So anyone who practices a school of magic believes that practitioners of other schools are backward savage idiots. You know, you're totally wrong. My god's the right one. My tribe's the right way. Whatever. What have you. Mm -hmm. So it adds that element. But there are rules in the captain's log that I'm writing that specify whether it works or not. And this is dependent upon the level of magic you actually want to play. Okay. I rec recommend a very low magic setting. Spells often, if almost always, fail. But every now and then, they may have an effect. So that kind of becomes like a character customization off customization in itself. You know, the types of fiat you can beseech your dungeon master for. You know... Uh, so, like, the holy guy, for example, may go and beseech the GM to kind of, like, give me, give me a plus, plus something to hit here. I prayed to God. Maybe. Roll the dice, see if he, he does or not. You know, or the witch doctor will be like, come on, man, I made this, uh, this voodoo doll and I'm stabbing it with a needle. Is it doing anything? Maybe, maybe not. So it's a way you can beseech the, the guy running the game for fiat. You know, and, and some hand waving, but there are codified rules depending on your level of magic for how often it actually works. So that's just one more way that somebody could care customize their character. Yeah. And I do um, I do appreciate the fact that you that um from the way you from the way you describe it, you have you have it set up that magic is not one size fits all, which is a pet peeve of mine in some in some systems where yeah. despite Magic users having different backgrounds for some reason they're still using the same set. Of oh mechanics. no, no, they they hate each other, dude. You know the the fucking holy guy looks at the tribal shaman like he's a backwards asshole. Um, and beyond that, I wanted to go further to explain why magic is such a low probability, and 
this kind of is delving into like lore, like mm-hmm. canonical insight, I guess. I haven't codified it yet in, a, in the written document, but I'm going to, is that magic functions off of belief in it. So when you are surrounded by like-minded individuals, like let's say you're, you're practicing tribal magic and you're back with your tribe trying to cast a spell, their belief in it reinforces the possibility of you actually casting it. Mm. Whereas when you're on a ship, of pirates who've been picked up from God knows where with all these different conflicting beliefs, you know, and everybody believes their way is the right way. It interferes with your ability to channel belief and create an effective working in the first place. Mm-hmm. And this also goes further to explain why magic still exists, but it's on the decline because we're getting into the age of sale, you know, rationality and, and you know, cause and effect and logos and logic are beginning to govern the world. So you're seeing less and less of it. That kind of explains as well mm-hmm. why it doesn't always happen. And the last thing I'm going to say on magic, because I kind of dig on this too, is that magic spells may have consequences. You always have an intended effect you want to solicit when you cast a spell, right? You're going to carve a beast mask out of wood and some dog over hopes that putting it on your face will grant you some advantage when you swim in the water, right? Or you're going to go and run a seance to channel the spirits of the dead and try and glean knowledge from them. Well, whatever spell you cast, if, if it solicits an effect, it can also solicit an unintended consequence. And the unintended consequences of spell are in league with what the spell actually does. So think like D&D's wild magic Minus the lol so random stupidity. You know, you summon that dead guy, he may not want to go back to the... Uh, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. You ask God for a blessing, but you're a filthy heretic who recently robbed a bunch of uh, poverty-stricken poor people in that last coastal sediment, so he's actually going to curse you instead. Mm-hmm. So that was one more element I wanted to include in there. Because... Yeah, like I said, it, it shouldn't be the main dish. It's it's the treat on the side. Mm-hmm. Now, given given the again that grounded set the grounded setup that I mentioned before that you that you're leaning towards, um, how do you reinforce that when it comes to how squishy people are going to be in a um, in an infantry level fight? I want them to be squishy. Uh, This is not happy-go-lucky hero adventure time. Mm -hmm. You are a common cutthroat pirate. You are expendable. Your living conditions are miserable. You are not saving the day and rescuing the princess. You are eating maggot-infested hardtack in the dark of the hold. You know? Mm -hmm. So I wanted that lethality to be there. I wanted that sense of high loss and and ease of death to be there. Mm -hmm. There's two ways you can die. Uh, I'm working with a hybridized hit point wounds system. Mm-hmm. So obviously you have a hit point pool. We all know what hit points are. Stretch if you're to to fight. But the issue with hit points, I've always felt, is that they don't actually calculate any sort of waning ability to fight as you sustain damage. So on the flip side, you have wounds. A wound system, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you can sustain so many wounds, you take a wound, maybe your arm goes lame and you have a hard time hitting somebody or your leg goes lame and you have a hard time walking. But my issue with wounds is that it fails to track that psychological element that hit points includes, you know, your grit, your resolve, or even intangible effects that may not necessarily cripple your legs or your arms or your head. So I hybridized them and I offered them both. So you have hit points and you have a wound threshold and you can be killed two ways. You can be killed by either receiving a wound above your wound threshold or by having your hit points reduced to zero. Obviously, hit points regenerate quickly. Wounds take like a week or two to heal, you know, before you can knock however many wounds off of your your wounds, currently incurred wounds. Mm -hmm. So I wanted people to have multiple ways to die. Mm -hmm. I wanted that essence of you know, oh shit, like, yeah, I may be going in this fight at whole hit points, but I have six wounds and my max is seven. This could go south very, very quickly with one bad roll. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted that that disposability factor. Um, 
Because like I said, you're not the hero of the story here. You're just a common cutthroat on a boat who got pressed into service. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, I want to shift over into into the we- into the weaponry question that can come that can come up because whenever you introduce common common ri- common ranged fi- um, firearms to any to any degree, you there have to be some degree of drawbacks. Otherwise, they end up outclassing melee. And right. given the right. given the fantasy of of the of the swash of swash and buckle in this era, um, how do you make how do you make sure that people don't try and overload with as with as many pistols as they can carry? <laughs> that is a good question. Well, with that, you know that really is being resolved in the exploits tree. Each weapon class has kind of been given a specific form of utility. You know, which it excels in. Uh, for example, you know, like uh, rifles, yeah, they're great and adept at people off at range. But if somebody closes in, well, you know, you have a, you don't really have much recourse. Whereas, you know, melee weapons have all these speci- specific and brutal options. It's mm-hmm. that gap. Um, inversely, uh, there are minimum and maximum range thresholds. You know, how close can somebody get to you before your accuracy with the wa- with a rifle or a pistol starts to wane? For example, um, mm-hmm. cover. Uh, obviously, cover is a huge facet. Uh, the way cover works is that when you are standing behind cover, uh, depending on the type of cover you are standing behind, whether it be full, average, uh, minimal, or complete, reduces your chance to be hit by any ranged attack. Uh, depending on the type of cover that it is. And that is, I believe, what is it? 70, 50, 30, and 10%. You know? So, like, if somebody's behind full cover, you have a 10% chance to shoot them with your pistol, regardless of how good your weapon skill actually is. Otherwise, you're going to hit the cover. You know? So that is another thing. Yeah, if somebody's shooting at you with a gun, or you know, even plucking at you with, like, a bow or something, because those are options too. Mm-hmm. That tribal shaman, he's probably going to use like a dark gun or something. So that kind of handicaps ranged weapons in a little bit of ways. Uh, we've run some tests, and I've found that the damage from melee weapons is disgustingly brutal. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it definitely outpaces the ranged weapons by a decent amount, which makes it a more appealing option. Mm-hmm. So there, there are ways to mitigate that that have been incorporated. I mean, will they be perfect? Probably not. Uh, the way I see it is every game ultimately has some form of meta, and the duty is of any, any rules lawyering player is to find it. Um, so I try not to spend too much time brooding on that question. But I have, I think, incorporated enough by way of environmental effects where ranged weapons and melee weapons can still function on a similar and of course since we since we got to that that brings us to the bigger end of things the naval combat which of course is going to be key to the fantasy of a game like this absolutely and i i could talk about that right now yeah so, Let me open up my computer just in case I want a little reference here. But so, go on, what's your question? The first question that I have involving naval combat is I think there I think it's fair of me to assume that mo- that most pla- most player character groups are only going to be dealing with one ship. Um the idea of managing fleets is some is not something that's going to happen for quite a while in most campaigns. Right. Now given given that since it is that one ship how do you make sure that you don't run into, say, the ha- the cyberpunk hacker problem where you've got one person doing all the work and everybody else is just sitting on their thumbs? That everybody I is off- contributing a, ro- a role in some form during naval combat. So when naval combat takes place, obviously you're going to have two kind of separate encounters going. Uh, you're going to have the actions of the player characters on an infantry scale map and the actions that take place on an infantry scale map. Players have the option to like board enemy vessels, for example, and 
vessels can set overboarding crew to compromise with their crew, or vice versa. So there, there is infantry-minded goals going into that. Uh, with that said, who calls the shots on what the ship does want? There are only two workarounds. The first is to elect a presiding officer, as you said, is chosen out of the group. There are the actions that the ship actually performs during the next skin combat. The other is to take a more democratic approach with it and opt for something akin to a D&D's caller, for example. You know, uh, everybody takes a vote, and then one person uh, relays the consensus to the Admiralty to then continue their actions on that turn. Mm -hmm. So you have the democratic option and you have the autocratic option, mm -hmm. which is, which are frankly your only two choices for resolving that issue. Uh, it's either everybody gets a say, or one person. and that is something that is left to each play group to determine. Uh, I make no pretense at saying which mode of play would work better for which kind of group. Mm -hmm. So that, that is something that the players will probably have to decide for themselves, ultimately, maybe even written into the articles when they sign them. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as how we do factions, so obviously you, you have multiple things going on in ship to ship life. You know, ships pass by each other, they're adjacent, they pass by at some point in their course and they're adjacent. Boarding parties can be sent over from ship to ship. Uh, you take a given amount of crew members out of your complement, they get their own HP pool, they go over to the enemy ship, they can perform crew actions, again, as decided by the Democratic Committee with the presiding officer. Obviously, mm -hmm. the crew on your ship can take retaliatory actions against the boarding party, again, decided by Democratic Committee or the presiding officer. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you know, the players can choose to remain on ship or go over to the enemy ship, uh, to keep things from getting too hectic, the boarding parties operate as giant, massive, singular hit points. You're not going to draw 50 guys on your map when the boarding party comes over. No, it's just there's a boarding party on your ship. This is the action it takes. There's the crew on your ship. This is the action it takes. On the infantry scale level, however, on that, uh, most goals that are player-oriented will tend to be things like trying to scuttle the ship, trying to seize the treasure, trying to execute the officers. Mm -hmm. So that is how that will ultimately play. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to advancement, are you doing a XP as currency kind of thing? So, your currency definitely is crucial to your advancement. Somebody isn't going to train you for free. Mm -hmm. So, you do need currency in order to actually convince somebody to teach you their knowledge. But additionally, not every advancement you can take in the exploits tree actually requires a trainer. You can simply just invest character points in them to get them. However, if something does require a trainer, then it will require that currency deposit plus the character points to get it. Mm -hmm. So there is kind of that gold as experience, but also not, you know. It, it, it swings both ways. It's not dedicated. It goes on a case-by-case -case basis. Like, if you're picking up a new combat move, mm -hmm. you know, you'll, you'll want somebody to teach you. If you are picking up something that can easily be inferred, or is just a virtue of your own personal being, like you're going up the bigger tree and you want something that makes you more tanky, mm -hmm. so like, you might not need somebody to show you that, and you can just buy it. So there's no need for a trainer there. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, you mentioned having around 25 skills, and this is something I've talked about a fair amount of times with people who have um, decent-sized skill systems, especially when when char when skills and character points get involved, sometimes there is an issue of analysis paralysis. Okay. Where pe where um people at or people are worried that the that the choice that the choice that they made with their alloc that their allocation ends up but ends up biting in the a them in the ass because they didn't invest in a specific skill for the campaign. Right. How how do you mitigate that issue? Well, ultimately, I've tried to make each skill in the subsequent exploit tree appealing in their own right. 
Um, with that said, you know, there is really no way to know what a DM wants to incorporate in their game. Mm-hmm. You know, some people may go traps heavy, others may not include it at all. Um, I don't really think I have done anything for that, to be quite frank with you, but now that you bring it up, it's I have to dedicate some brain space to it. Yeah, it's what I do. Yeah, no, that is that is a that is a valid point. Mm-hmm. Uh, hell yeah, feedback. All right. Now, I know it's currently in playtesting, but do you have a release window that you have in mind as far as when you'd when you'd put out the do- the document for open feedback? I'm hoping that the document will be out for open feedback come this summer. Um. Infantry combat is getting dialed in to just about where I would like it to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, all that really is the that the true manifest, which is the core of the player's book, will be ready to public. Uh, obviously, I'd like to get the captain's log or G out beside it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm looking at late summer, is, is my current expectation. With that said, that will probably be a beta test uh, public version. Uh, I, I wouldn't be putting it on a, on a stack just yet. I would like one back because, like I said, these are my personal play tests and they're heavily open to bias. Mm-hmm. You know? I, I know what I want, but what does the world want as well? I should factor that in too. Mm-hmm. So, late summer is the, the tentative date I'm giving. Late summer, early fall. And that, that gives you more than enough time to get the uh, the crew manifest dialed in. The crew manifest is basically done safe for art. I'm going to have to illustrate the damn thing myself because I don't got money to pay anybody, dude, you know. Uh, and ideally, I can get the captain's log out alongside it. But worst case, then I'm expecting the captain's log by the coming winter. Mm-hmm. I would like them to come out hand in hand, side by side. Because the captain's log will have a lot of useful information in it. Like, for example, how does magic really work? Mm-hmm. That's I, I'm opting for a low information style of gameplay. Less players know. I feel like adds more relevant information. Not so bent on analyzing the mechanics behind it. Mm-hmm. Someone's like, oh well, if I do this, I only have a twenty percent chance of success. So why would I even bother? You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas if they don't know. Or better yet, if it changes from game to game, depending on your admiralty, it kind of makes it more spicy, more appealing, and helps with the immersion. Mm. You're not crunching numbers in your head, you're focusing more on the play. Yeah. So I want them to come out in tandem, but it may not be the case. Worst mm-hmm. case, core rules will be dropped, and I'll go and dump the magic somewhere else, or whatever needs to be dumped somewhere else, and release that in expansion. Mm-hmm. But I am looking at summer. Now, with that, with that, with all of that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> Absolutely, and man. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, next time I'll make sure I have some beer because uh, I did not come here yeah. today. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!